Get ready, Ohio. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, is coming to the Buckeye State. And to kick things off, you can get started with $100 in free bets as an early sign-up bonus. Plus, when you sign up today with promo code OHIOSB, you'll be all set for when FanDuel goes live in Ohio. Then you can bet on all your favorite teams and all your favorite sports with $100 in free bets. Just download FanDuel's top-rated sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Ohio, this is your chance to get in on the action. Join today with promo code OHIOSB. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. 21 plus and present in Ohio. Bonus issued in non-withdrawable free bets that expire seven days after FanDuel accepts its first real money sports wager in Ohio on one Unique user identity verification required. Offer ends on the go-live date. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. You know those times in the day when you can't fit in a full podcast? Running out to the store, walking the dog, or washing the dishes? Jam is the new way to listen when you have just enough time for the perfect short audio playlist. Get started at listentojam.com slash podcast and get your daily Jam playlist filled with more voices in less time. With Jam, you can choose from news, parenting tips, wellness advice, and more. Go to listentojam.com slash podcast and satisfy your curiosity with short audio. Discover something new every day. Hey folks, welcome to the Adventure Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Mason. Uh, Today is a throwback episode to 2018 when we talked to Laura Krantz about a crazy story when she came across uh, the fact that she was related to an anthropologist who had spent much of his career looking for Bigfoot. And so after writing an article about this crazy coincidence and, and, and kind of all the things she began to find while uh, looking at the life of her relative. Um, She made a podcast about it, a really good podcast. And at the time she was working for NPR, started this podcast to just explore kind of the relationship between science and society and study the folks who who look for Bigfoot. So it's a really interesting idea. And what I love about this and how it ties into Adventure Sports Podcast is just the, the concept of exploration. I love uh, when I run into, you know, an unexpected, an unexpected things happens, you know, that uh, in a certain day, I, I live for the spontaneous and for the unexpected. Just the other day, I think I might have already shared this story. I was kayaking probably a month ago now, and an old man was on the shore. I was with my son. I, actually, we were paddle boarding, and we get to talk, and this guy's almost 80, and we we're just literally talking, talking about our life, and there's a connection made. I mentioned my grandfather's name, and he goes, "Whoa, I know who that is." And this is you know hours away from where I grew up. And uh, come to find out, we're related. Me and this man I've never met before at a beach that I hardly go to that I was paddleboarding on with my son. We're cousins, and I, I just I love stuff like that. So um, this story is so uh, so cool because you never know where. If you just start looking, start unearthing things, start following curiosity, how it can just lead to more and more adventure. And that's what adventure is all about, is following curiosity and following that feeling of what's around the corner. So this podcast has three seasons, very well produced, very well uh, critically acclaimed, lots of awards. Uh, Give it a shot. And it is called Wild Thing. So look for the podcast Wild Thing on your podcast app. Give it a listen and listen to Laura's story. And then it turns out he was also the country's preeminent academic expert on Bigfoot. So I find out about this guy. This was probably about 10 years ago, and he had already passed away. And here he is, this like serious scientist. He's a physical anthropologist. He's well-respected in his field. And then he also is looking for Bigfoot. And I kind of thought, well, if this guy's a scientist... Maybe there's something more to this than I actually thought, because I always thought of Bigfoot as being kind of a joke, tongue-in-cheek, campfire story, 
you know, the kind of the kind of story you tell when you're sitting around the campfire after a long day of, of hiking or or camping. Um, and so that was the genesis for the podcast was going out and looking at the evidence and hearing some of the stories of people who have had Bigfoot encounters and going out into the woods with them and uh, sort of seeing what it is about this creature that fascinates so many people, even though they don't necessarily believe. It is, so far, I've I've listened to a handful of episodes, and uh, you're 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 you admit that you're pretty skeptical, and that it seems crazy, you know, especially if anyone involved in academia. Um, did that opinion change for you? I know you can't reveal too much about the show before listening, <laughs> but you know, how did you feel going into it, and and why this story out of all the other stories? Because you're you're a uh, your experience, you worked for NPR, um, you, you've done other um, sorts of programs, but but why Bigfoot? Yeah, well, the Bigfoot thing was because of this family relationship. The fact that this guy was my grandfather's cousin, that he had been so well-respected, and then he was looking for Bigfoot. So I really wanted to sort of square those two things and figure out exactly why it was that he was willing to sort of put his credentials on the line, put his reputation on the line to go out and look for Bigfoot. Um, so that was the the reason I got into it. And, you know, going in, I kind of expected there to be a lot of tin foil hat types, conspiracy theorists. Um, you know, I, I, my, uh, my real exposure to Bigfoot has been the cover, you know, the cover of, a. Uh, the Weekly World News and the National Enquirer or stuff like Harry and the Henderson. So it seemed very, very silly. But as a journalist and as someone who has worked in journalism for a long time now, I, my, I, my goal was to go in and try and be, an op- be as open-minded as possible about the experience and what it was that was drawing people to this creature and making them willing to spend weeks, if not months at a time, out in the woods trying trying to find real scientific evidence and proof, the kind of physical evidence that would convince people of Bigfoot's existence. So who did you first tell about your idea to start this podcast where you were like, uh, is this a good idea? <laughs> yeah, uh, there, you know, Bigfoot, there's a there's kind of a cultural thing with Bigfoot where if it's if you're talking about it tongue in cheek, and it's just kind of as a joke, then it's okay to talk about Bigfoot. But the minute you sort of cross that line into thinking about it from a little bit more of a serious perspective and uh, and saying that, okay, maybe this is real, then I think you run into uh, a a little bit of a, a it's almost a taboo in a way. Like people are kind of like, oh, maybe you're crazy. And you know, uh, I don't, I don't think you're, you're real, a real serious journalist if you are out looking for Bigfoot. So that was, I was a little worried about that. I was a little worried that in tackling this topic, even from doing it doing it from the perspective of trying to do it open-mindedly and really looking at what information was out there, that I would kind of be tarred with that brush of being a crackpot or a crazy person. Um, and that, you know, that I think continues a little bit. Like people will ask, what have you been working on in the past year and a half? And I'm always a little embarrassed to say, well, I've been working on Bigfoot. And then they kind of look at you with a raised eyebrow. But I found that when I explain what I'm doing and what the, where this came from and why I'm interested in it, a lot of people kind of start nodding their heads and then they start asking questions because they've got their own theories about Bigfoot. Or even if they haven't put a lot of thought into it, it's enough of a presence in American culture and North American culture that people are interested and they are curious and they want to know more. So it's been fun from that standpoint. Even the people who are the diehard skeptics often end up really wanting to have a conversation about it. Well, you, you know, you present it in a, a really interesting way and you're right. I mean, the, the, I believe stickers, uh, I see them all over cars. It's a huge part of our culture and, or at least growing when I was first heard about the podcast, I, I was like, okay, all right, is she serious or what? Because, you know, I, most people are probably pretty skeptical. And you approach it in a way where you're like, yes, I know this sounds crazy. Yes, I am skeptical. Yes, this and that. But here are a few things that are really interesting about it. And you can decide for yourself what that means. Mm-hmm. And, you you know, you present the people in a way that doesn't make them sound 
so foolish. They're like, oh, these are normal people, and these are real experiences that this guy had. Like, what would you do if you feel like you really saw this? It, but after, you know, not even ever even thinking about it. So you do a really good job with that, and it really draws the listener in. Yeah. And that was my goal. I really didn't want to, my goal was not to go in here and make fun of people or um, turn them into a laughing stock or some, or the butt of some sort of joke. Like I really wanted to go in with an open mind and talk to people who were trying to pursue this from the standpoint of being curious about the world around them and curious about an experience that they had had. And I can't discount their experience. I can't say you didn't see that. You didn't have that experience. That didn't happen to you. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw, but they clearly saw or experienced something that changed their perspective on the natural world and on this creature. So from that standpoint, it's, you know, it would be pretty rude of me, I think, to go in and be like, you're an idiot. Um, So I really just wanted to hear their perspective on things. And I also ultimately what I found out is, you know, they're curious about the world. They have a question and they want to find an answer to it. They want to understand what either happened to them or happened to their friend or understand more about the the possibility for creatures like this existing out there. And to me, that's no crazier than people who are looking for life in outer space or, um, you know, trying to bottle consciousness or all the other sort of weird science things that we're constantly coming up with. That's like, that's part of being human is asking those kinds of questions and trying to figure out the world around you and trying to, to figure out if what happened to you is really what happened or if, if it's a misinterpretation of evidence. Like, um, I just really didn't see what the issue was by the end of it. I, I know people and I've had experiences myself uh, that I just to this day, I can't really explain. Mm-hmm. Um, and every time I think about them, it, it is, you know, a few hours of like, what, what was happening there? Why, why have I not pursued knowing what that meant more? But it, it's so daunting that, you know, you just kind of tend to want to move on with your life. Yeah. Uh, and I think for some people, they kind of have those experiences and then they move on with their lives. And I think for some people, it's really life altering. They see something and it really changes things for them. I talked to a couple of people who picked up and moved states, moved their whole family, quit their job and really became almost obsessed, not to the point where they couldn't keep a family and have a job and, you know, live a normal life, but it really became their driving force. They were really wanted to see this creature again or have that experience again and really understand what had happened to them. Um, Now, to be fair, I was a little bit selective in the people I talked to because Mm. Grover, this Grover, this relative of mine was a scientist and was approaching this from a more scientific standpoint. My feeling was, is those were the kinds of people that I needed to be talking to in order to pursue this the same way that he might've pursued it. Um, Uh, So if someone said that Bigfoot was dropped off by aliens or Bigfoot exists in another dimension or Bigfoot travels through time, I tended to steer clear of the sort of paranormal, supernatural, magical Bigfoot, because that to me was just, that was a bridge too far. That was something that was going to be very hard, A, to prove, and B, I just, I didn't see how that could work. How could this be the only creature in, in the universe that uh, has those kinds of attributes, whereas every other creature on the planet is pretty well stuck with the the biology that it's been given. So I did talk to people who tended to be pretty grounded in the laws of physics and nature and reality. These were people who, and a lot of them were outdoor enthusiasts. They're people who have spent a lot of time backpacking. Um, and in the backcountry, they were people who were working for the Bureau of Land Management or the U.S. Forest Service. Um, and really would be out in the middle of nowhere uh, and have these kinds of experiences that that change their perspective on things. But they were people who were familiar with the outdoors, who were familiar with the wildlife in an area. And um, so they weren't someone who, who were going to be easily startled by the, a bear and not be able to recognize what it was. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that helped make this show possible. 
Hi, welcome to your neighborhood pharmacy. Hi, I've got a prescription for diabetes test strips. How much is the copay? Well, it depends on your type of commercial insurance and factoring in your yearly spend, subtracting the deductibles, also depending on your monthly Ugh, allowance. Why can't there be a better option? Or you could try Contour Next test strips. A 35 counts only $19.99 over the counter and proven to be highly accurate. Go to contournext.com slash radio to see if over the counter strips are a more affordable option for you. Hmm, I think I'll try Contour Next. Hey there, BreezeLine has a holiday gift just for you. One month of free internet for all your family's gift sites, book flights, and movie nights. Get reliable, fast internet with speeds starting at 100 megabits per second for just $19.99 a month. Plus, free Wi-Fi your way home for the first 12 months. And your first month is free. BreezeLine wishes you all a happy and bright holiday season. If only they could give you a little holiday relief from all the matching family outfits. Service subject to availability. New residential customers in select areas only. Visit BreezeLine.com for complete offer details. Get ready, Ohio. FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, is coming to the Buckeye State. And to kick things off, you can get started with $100 in free bets as an early sign-up bonus. Plus, when you sign up today with promo code OHIOSB, you'll be all set for when FanDuel goes live in Ohio. Then you can bet on all your favorite teams and all your favorite sports with $100 in free bets. Just download FanDuel's top-rated sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Ohio, this is your chance to get in on the action. Join today with promo code OHIOSB. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. 21 plus and present in Ohio. Bonus issued in non-withdrawable free bets that expire seven days after FanDuel accepts its first real money sports wager in Ohio on one Unique user identity verification required. Offer ends on the go-live date. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. Yeah, uh, one of the biggest uh, proponents of uh, Bigfoot that I knew of growing up was a professor at the University of Florida, a friend of mine's mother. And she didn't teach anything that had to do with that, but she was obviously a a very sensible person. And uh, she just almost enjoyed the thought of there being an animal that big out there that we haven't discovered. And she was a a believer. I don't think it was much from a scientific standpoint, more of like an entertainment value, but still, um, they're not all, like you said, aluminum foil hat wearing UFO searchers. So, so did, did seeing those kinds of people, um, who had maybe these inexplicable experiences as well as maybe just a belief without having any um, previous experience, did that change your perspective on what you view someone who believes in Bigfoot now? Totally. Yeah. Uh, that completely changed my perspective. I mean, there was a couple of people I talked to, one of whom had been with, um, the Bureau of Land Management, the Forest Service and Fish and Wildlife. He'd worked for all three of these departments in one time or another. Um, you know, spent a lot of time out in the middle of nowhere in wilderness areas. And his story you know, he was, he was camping. He was in the back country. He thought it was a bear from the get go. Um, you know, he never, never even entered his mind that this was, this thing was Bigfoot, but it was behaving so strangely. And the experience was so contrary to any other experience he'd had with a bear, um, that he just, you know, he, it really puzzled him. And then after he has this experience where this thing is sort of by his tent and then is throwing things at him, and breathing really strangely, you know, he goes back to his, um, back to base camp or back to the, to the base, the forest service, um, outpost that he was sort of working out of. And he mentions this to his boss and his boss says, did you ever consider the fact that it might be Bigfoot? Um, because other people had had called into the forest service and said they'd had similar experiences in this area. And so, you know, for, for John, this guy's name was John Mayanzinski. Um, Bigfoot was not something he'd ever even really thought about. And then his boss made that suggestion and it be, the pieces kind of fell into place for him. And so to hear his story, someone who still to this day is doing a lot of work for, uh, out in wilderness areas, he really, that changed, that changed his mind. And he's very soft-spoken. He's not a braggart. He's not out there telling some sort of crazy story to try and get attention. He doesn't really bring it up in polite conversation unless you're asking him specifically about it. 
So to me, that really makes those stories hard to dismiss. Um, you know, they just, they're too, they're too crazy to be just sort of thrown away as, um, just made up stories. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious, did this experience producing the show make you change the way you view things that other people believe that you might've viewed before as crazy or unscientifically um, found? Yeah, that is a good question. You know, I hadn't really thought about that because I would guess some of the other ones might be like Loch Ness Monster or the Yeti or, uh, I don't know, Chupacabra. Um, or maybe I, even religiously, I don't know. Like anything that's kind of like, is there any proof for any of that? Yeah, well, and I think I think that's a, that's a hard one to answer because ultimately uh, with, with Bigfoot, there's still that hard evidence doesn't exist. And yet you still have these, these personal encounters which are hard to hard to dismiss. So I don't know. That's a really good question. Um, I tend to view religion with a little bit of a skeptical eye, but I think that comes more from sort of what the the uh, negative effects that of religion can have on the uh, the world at large sometimes. Um, but you know, if if people have an experience where they think that they've spoken to God or seen angels, um, you know, it, it's I guess it wouldn't be very sporting of me to say you should consider you should be open minded about Bigfoot, but close minded about God. Like, um, that's yeah, yeah that's, <laughs> that's good because I, you know, I'm pretty skeptical too when it comes to anything that I can't necessarily can be proven or at least uh, plenty of evidence for. But I, I, I listen to people that I know, specifically your podcast. I listened to it this morning um, about four episodes, and it's like, man, these people are really good hearted, sincere, and they have this belief that there is this giant freaking animal in this little peninsula. You know what I mean? That people are always backpacking in and, and I, I was just in Olympic uh, about a month ago and mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. I mean it it's crazy to think there's like something the size of the a gorilla out here and maybe possibly I think you mentioned uh two thousand of them roaming the earth. So that's wild to me. But I can't dismiss that, you know, the, these personal experiences these people had. And uh, I wanted to bring up, a, why, why'd you choose that area? Just because that's where your uh, family member was um, focusing his attention? Yeah, well, you know, the, the 2000 number, I think, is for Bigfoot in general. Bigfoots, big feet. Um, they are, I, it's more than just the Olympic Peninsula. You yes. know, Bigfoot has supposedly been sighted in every state but Hawaii, mainly because Bigfoot can't swim that far, supposedly. That is funny you say that, because I just looked up a map of all the Bigfoot sightings, and yeah, it's uh -huh. worldwide. Um, uh, you know, the different variations of Bigfoot, from the Yeti to Sasquatch or whatever, and there were a couple on islands, and I was like, how the heck did he get over there? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, I would imagine that there are a fair number of stories out of there that come out of the bottom of a whiskey bottle as opposed to, like, an actual... Uh, experience that's maybe a little <laughs> sober. Right. Um, <clears throat> but um, I would say that, you know, it, it's, it is a little hard to imagine when you think about the number of people out there in the woods with cameras in their pockets, essentially, you know, more and more people are encroaching on these territories or out hiking in them are, are exploring them. And that certainly does lower the possibility of something like this existing um, since there hasn't been the kind of conclusive evidence and photograph photographic evidence that would really, you know, settle this matter once and for all. Um, the reason I ended up on the Olympic Peninsula is partially because that's where Grover, my relative, did some of his work, but also because when I went out there, or when I was doing the research on this, um, I was invited to come look at these giant ground nests. And this uh, timber company owned a bunch of land out adjacent to the Olympic National Forest. And it's private timberland, gated and locked. And a member of the family that owns that land was out doing a timber survey. And he was kind of walking through looking to see which, which trees they were going to be cutting for the next harvest. And 
he came across these giant nests and they were basically 10, nine feet across. They were ground nests and they were very intricately woven. Um, they all, they look like bird's nests, like much more, uh, not just like a heap of debris, but sort of deliberately manipulated and put together. And this is a guy who's been out doing this job for decades now, and he hadn't seen anything like it. So he's kind of scratching his head about the whole thing. And then he goes to, uh, he calls up the Department of um, Natural Resources in Washington, and he calls up this group called the Olympic Project, which is the sort of local Bigfoot research group. And the representatives from both of those groups came out. They're all scratching their heads, wondering what this is. It doesn't look like a bear bed. It doesn't look like a deer bed. And so the timber company says, okay, we're curious enough about this that we're going to give you five years to figure out what these things are. We'll go log somewhere else. We're going to give you keys to the land and we'll let you do this for five years. But at that point, we've got to come back. We've got to do the harvest. So this was about three years ago now. And they, the Olympic Project sat on these nests for two years because the nests had been freshly made. All of the flora in it was fresh. It was green still. It had been freshly broken off. And those nests were basically maybe a month old at the most. So they kind of thought, all right, well, whatever made these might be coming back. So they sort of sat on them, not literally, but like sat near them and observed them for a couple of years to see if whatever made them would come back. Nothing did. So then they brought in a another Bigfoot specialist, a guy named Jeff Meldrum, who's an anthropologist at Idaho State University and who kind of picked up the mantle from my cousin Grover. And he came out and looked at him and was also kind of confused. He said they look a lot like gorilla nests, because if you go online and you Google gorilla nests, you will see gorillas making these big ground nests. Um, and it's something that's taught, like they teach the younger generations how to make these nests. You can actually see video of them weaving these things together. So again, you know, nobody can say definitively that these were made by Bigfoot, but they are definitely weird. And so the decision was to take some samples from those nests and ship them off to a lab at, um, New York university where there is, uh, a molecular primatologist out there who runs DNA analysis. And so that's that's uh, uh, a big part of the storyline for the podcast is is trying to figure out what these nests are. So I assume you won't share your views of that right now of what those nests. <laughs> I don't want to get I don't want to give away the ending. I okay perfect yeah I didn't realize that the story was going to follow those nests so closely so man I'm excited now because I actually looked up some pictures after I heard that and it's really bizarre. It, it does yeah. look a lot like real in essence. Like, is someone out there pranking people? Is it, you know, is it just some phenomenon? What, what is actually on them? You know, so I'm really curious. Um, that is a very bizarre part of the country, but isn't it beautiful out there? Oh my gosh, it's totally gorgeous. And while I was up there, I had a chance to go up to, um, what is it? Cape, uh, Cape Flattery. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. And man, what a view from that. That is just like, that's so beautiful up there. And just the view out over the water and like that pristine forest, like it's just, it's phenomenal. I really loved it up there. The combination of the mountains and, and the rainforest and the salmon and the ocean all kind of coming together in just this perfect, uh, just example of beauty. And it's like every kind of animal is represented there uh, uh, on top of possibly Bigfoot. So there's, there's so much to love about the area. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so mm -hmm. for you, this, this story was kind of started because you, uh, you know, you found a long lost cousin of yours. I, is there the possibility from a scientific view that Bigfoot is a, a long lost cousin that used to exist, even if it, he or she, doesn't exist they. now. They, <laughs> yeah, and they, that, that's what that I'm was for. actually, yeah, <laughs> that was one of the questions I was really interested in exploring, actually, because the other, uh, the flip side of a lot of the eyewitness accounts is that there's also a tremendous number of Native American and First Nations accounts, and they go back centuries. They go mm. back to colonial um, times. So then you start to wonder, okay, well, 
maybe there was a creature once upon a time, even if there isn't one now. And if that's the case, where would it fit in the evolutionary tree? Would it be related to us? Is it more closely related to other species? And so the second episode, I really spend a lot of time exploring the evolution of all of this and trying to figure out where and how Bigfoot would fit into um, fit into the overall phylogenetic tree. And there's sort of two main theories. You know, one is that Bigfoot is more closely related to the great apes, that it's descended from a giant species of ancient ape out of Asia, and it would have come along, come over the Bering Land Bridge, along with a lot of other species that ended up in North America, including bears. Um, so that's one theory. And that was the theory that my relative Grover subscribed to. The other theory is that it might be what's called a relic hominid, um, which is to say it's much more closely related to humans and it would be descended from a more, uh, from a human ancestor, a hominid ancestor. Once upon a time, there were as many as eight different human-like species walking the planet around the same time. Um, and that's the, those are the ones that we know about because there's a lot of stuff in the fossil record that we don't really have evidence of because it just, you know, if you want to be a fossil, you have to die in the right place at the right time, at the right conditions, um, with the right sediments nearby. And then you have to survive however many thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years and then you have to be uncovered at the right place at the right time by the right people who know what they're looking at. So if you think about it from that standpoint, there's probably a lot of stuff out there that we don't know about existing ever. Mm. So, you know, this could have Bigfoot could have been or something like Bigfoot could have been could have been one of them. Let's take a quick message break and hear from the folks that help make this show possible. Love Target. Well, you're about to love it even more. With Target's Red Card Debit Card, you'll save 5% every Target trip, on top of everyday low prices, in-store and online. Debit Red Card links from your existing bank account. Visit Target.com slash Red Card to get all the details. Restrictions apply. Winter season is here, and Discount Tire wants you to stay safe on the road. Get 30% shorter average wait time when you buy and book online at DiscountTire.com. Discount Tire. Let's get you taken care of. You know those times in the day when you can't fit in a full podcast? Running out to the store, walking the dog, or washing the dishes? Jam is the new way to listen, when you have just enough time for the perfect short audio playlist. Get started at listentojam.com slash podcast and get your daily Jam playlist filled with more voices in less time. With Jam, you can choose from news, parenting tips, wellness advice, and more. Go to listentojam.com slash podcast and satisfy your curiosity with short audio. Discover something new every day. That is plenty of that for now. Let's get back into the episode. That's a good point because uh, my imagination is definitely open to the fact that, oh yeah, this exact animal of what we're picturing as Bigfoot or very, very similar could have easily existed at some point. And the fact that, you know, fossils haven't been found well i live right next to dinosaur ridge here in denver and it's literally a road that they started building and just started uncovering all these skeletons and all these footprints and now they're all on display but they stopped the process of building the road because they just were disrupting too many of these fossils or finding too many it was taking too long to build just this little road over a ridge and just i think last year they were building a police station here um and, a tr- and an entire Triceratops uh, uh, fossilized skeleton was underneath. And so That's they amazing. Stopped, they stopped entire production. It was like one of the most well-preserved uh, specimens ever found, all because they were building a new police station. So you have no idea what's under there. You're, you're totally right about that. Right. D- did you enjoy the process? Was it fun? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was a blast. I mean, not only do you get to kind of like, you, you get to kind of come at this from almost like you're a little kid. Um, You know, your goal is to sort of suspend your disbelief, suspend your previously held opinions on it, and to just go in and ask questions and be curious and get to know these people and learn about what something that's very important to them. 
um, and go out into the woods with them on adventures and hear their stories. And it really was a lot of fun. Um, I just, I really, I enjoyed talking to people a lot more than I kind of expected. I was a little worried about, you know, am I going to be able to, are they going to trust me? Am I going to be able to relate to them? Um, but everyone was very welcoming and they opened up and they let me ask questions. Um, and it just, it really was a lot of fun. Plus I enjoy camping. I enjoy hiking. And I got a couple of opportunities to go out and do that. And then you add on the Bigfoot element of it and it kind of makes it a little bit spooky and a little bit, um, a little more thrilling. And yeah, I had a blast. That is awesome. So, so what's been the reception of the show so far? Um, it's been really good. People have written, I've gotten tons of, of fan mail, which is fantastic. Um, I've gotten very little hate mail, which is also fantastic. Um, <laughs> I think, I think for Bigfoot people, uh, people who are already really deep in this world and well-versed in it, uh, a lot of what I talked about was kind of old hat. And so I think there was some like, you know, you haven't told us anything new, but this really wasn't aimed at people who are already in the world of Bigfoot. It was aimed at people like me who hadn't really thought about Bigfoot or just kind of considered it to be something of a joke. Um, and I was surprised at how many people just were really receptive to that. You know, they wrote in, they said I was a complete skeptic. I thought this was silly, but I listened. And now I look over my shoulder when I go hiking. Like they're just, Thank there's something fun. For, uh, about, encouraging yeah. uh, anxiety in people as they yeah. hike. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there's something fun about Bigfoot. And even if you don't subscribe to the possibility of it, that it's just, there's something very compelling about uh, the world being wild enough and unexplored enough still that something like this could be out there. And I think that really tugs at a lot of people's heartstrings. Now, was that your goal? Yes, totally. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I want people to go outside into the woods and, and, and kind of be looking around corners and be curious about what they're seeing. Like, you know, take your headphones out of your ears, except when you're listening to this podcast. And, um, Yours just, as well. Yeah, yeah. both podcasts. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know listen to the, the sounds of nature and be observant and, you know, and, and savor the possibility that something really fascinating and interesting is out there. So, so with those antennas up out while you're out in, you know, a, a, a pretty remote, uh, it's popular, but it's a remote area. Um, and I actually watched a documentary, I think I was in high school, there was a guy that like living full time in the Olympic Peninsula, he'd only come into town like once a year to get, I don't know, some sort of meat that he couldn't get anywhere else. And toilet paper. Uh, toilet paper or something. Yeah, I don't know. So, I mean, it was it was really bizarre. And my mother was actually, she told me, she goes, I'm worried that you're going to be like this man at some point. <laughs> But, nice. but did, so with those antennas up and that level of curiosity, did you discover anything out there that you didn't expect, like a body or just some random stuff or people living anywhere that you didn't expect? I did not find any bodies. Uh, I, I, uh, I buried some, but I didn't find any. <laughs> no, I'm just I was kidding. like, holy cow, is that in the show? <laughs> uh, yeah. I just, uh, I just confessed to a murder. Um, you know, you, there was, let's see, there was part, where were we? We were on the same land where the nests had been found and there was something, I have to think back on this now. There were, uh, these trees that had been infested by a fungus. Um, and they were pine trees and the fungus was like way up in the topmost branches and what was interesting, and this was sort of behavior that had not been documented before, but raccoons had basically like excavated this fungus and were living in it. Um, and I may not have the details entirely right. It's been a while. It's been uh, a quite a bit of time since I was out there. So I'd probably have to go back and look this up. But this was behavior that a number of people who were out there said, you know, we've never seen anything like this with raccoons before. And they really wanted to try and get some scientists out there but to look at that behavior. You know, the Bigfoot 
Bigfoot nests aside, these ground nests aside, they wanted someone to look at this too. But I think the association with Bigfoot was making it hard for them to get people out there to check this out. It could very well have been completely normal behavior, just kind of rare because this fungus isn't all that rare. But it's the kind of thing where it's like these people are out looking for Bigfoot. They're out observing stuff in the woods. And then they're seeing other things that are interesting natural behaviors. Um, and I thought that was kind of cool, too. Um, another example of this is there's a guy in Scotland who's decided he wants to run DNA analysis on Loch Ness, not because he thinks that he's going to find the Loch Ness monster, but by doing this DNA analysis on the water and some of the sediments, they think that, that they might find what kinds of other animals are living in the lake or have lived in the lake because DNA analysis has now gotten to the point where it's so powerful that they can find, they can identify species based on very, very small fragments of DNA and old ones too. So I thought that was, you know, that's kind of cool. Like you're going out, you're looking for something that's, that may or may not exist. And then you're finding out some really interesting things about the natural world. And honestly, I mean, that's, probably the most positive byproduct of this is, you know, bringing people together, getting them outside, um, hiking, being active, and hopefully not going too crazy trying to, to find this, but but treating it as a, a pursuit that they can enjoy, kind of like you did. Yeah, exactly. And I know there are some people who are dumping a lot of time and money and energy into this. Um, someone I talked to he said, you know, there are some people who get very obsessed with this. He he compared it to gold fever. You know, if I can just find the body, if I can just get that photo, if I can just get this, this thing that will prove it, and they just get a little bit obsessed. But I think that has less to do with Bigfoot and more to do with uh, people. Like, there are just people get obsessed about certain things. So in this case, it just happens to be Bigfoot. Most of the people I met were pretty... You know, they had families and jobs and other hobbies and Bigfoot was one thing that they're very interested in, but it hasn't prevented them from living a normal, a normal life. Good. Yeah. And I, I think so far what I've listened to, you've done a really good job of breaking that down because, you know, we, we cover adventure sports. We cover everything from climbing Everest to, you know, getting off the couch for the first time and to go hiking. And so you know, obviously with stuff like that, people get really obsessive. People spend their life savings to go climb Mount Everest, which, you know, it's, it's super dangerous. And is it ethically wrong? So it's all this stuff. They neglect their children for it. So we, we try to stay away from those kinds of, of, uh, people, but, um, finding that balance is really important. So this, this can be, you know, searching for Bigfoot, but can be a, a sport in itself. Um, so just, you know, once the, you know, this is not an ongoing, um, ongoing series. It's kind of like a, a, a serial. It's all released together at once. And there's a, a final episode. What do you think is next for you? And, and has this experience shaped the way you're going to, uh, be a journalist moving forward? Um, let's see. I don't know entirely what's next. I'm trying to sort of figure that out right now. Um, the last episode for this podcast came out two days ago. So now your listeners are lucky. They can binge on the whole thing. Oh, they don't have perfect. to wait week to week. Um, there'll be a couple more bonus episodes, some extra interviews that I did with interesting people who didn't really fit into the overall storyline, but are, were just fun interviews. Those will still to come out. But the main the main episodes are all done. And now, yeah, I need to figure out what I want to tackle next. I don't think I'm going to do something else cryptozoological simply because uh, the reason I got into this was because of the relative that I had and the relationship, his relationship with Bigfoot. So that's really what drew me in. I don't really have that feeling with any other creature like that. Mm. So um, now I'm trying to figure out what what else would be interesting for me to cover and what else is kind of weird and compelling for listeners. So it's finding that that balance. Like, how am I going to get people who are fascinated by Bigfoot to talk, to listen to something else? And so I have to find something that's probably equally uh, a little bit out there. So no, no ideas rolling around yet? Or no, oh, I've got a kind few, of a but I'm, yeah, I'm just not ready to talk about them because they're not fully fleshed out. And mm -hmm. I don't want anyone, I don't want any of your listeners to steal them. I don't want you to steal them. 
Right. Well, that's, you know, that's what I did before this. I was in jail <laughs> for theft. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> Great job. It's really entertaining so far. I'm really excited to listen to the rest. And knowing that I can pretty much binge on it all today, I probably will. <laughs> oh, good. Um, how many episodes is it total, just so we can, our listeners know? Yeah, so there are nine main story episodes, and then there will be uh, four bonus episodes. Two of those have already come out, and then there'll be two more. Um, you can go and, and find my podcast, Wild Thing. It's available on Apple Podcasts. It's available on Stitcher, pretty much anywhere you get podcasts. Um, you can also check out our website, which is wildthingpodcast.com. And if you if you don't listen to podcasts through the normal channels, you can hear it there, too. Yeah. So listen, listen, listen up and then tell all of your friends. Perfect. Yes. Uh, and I, that was my next question was, how can people listen? How can they be in touch with you? Um, if there's anything else you want to plug, feel free. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for being on the show. This has been really, really fun. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. And yeah, if you go to the website, you can find a way to contact me. Um, I'm also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And the handle for that is Wild Thing Pod. Perfect. All right. And I will plug all that when we release the show. And, awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, thanks for doing this. And I look forward to your future stories. I'm excited to see what the next one's going to be. Awesome. Thank you so much. Take care. Yep. You have a good one. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Right. Bye. First of all, thank you so much for listening. It means the world to us that you choose to listen to the show. If you'd like to help us further, you can leave a review on iTunes, share us with your friends, your family. It goes a long way to grow in the show. You can also support us financially through patreon.com slash adventure sports podcast. Link is in the show notes. And also, if you have an idea of who could be a good guest for the show, we're always looking for people to tell their story uh, about the outdoors or adventure. So if you know someone, please reach out. Email us at info at adventuresportspodcast.com. And until then, get out there and have some fun. At Jiffy Lube, it's our job to keep you moving. With a full range of services from oil changes and tire rotations to filters, wipers, and more, we've got what your car needs right when you need it, so you're ready for whatever's next. Putting you in the driver's seat of car care? That's a job for Jiffy. Hi, welcome to your neighborhood pharmacy. Hi, I've got a prescription for diabetes test strips. How much is the copay? Well, it depends on your type of commercial insurance and factoring in your yearly spend, subtracting the deductibles, also depending on your monthly Ugh, allowance. Why can't there be a better option? Or you could try Contour Next test strips. A 35 counts only $19.99 over the counter and proven to be highly accurate. Go to contournext.com slash radio to see if over the counter strips are a more affordable option for you. Hmm, I think I'll try Contour Next.